Hello, Prague. It's great to uh, great to see you. Great that you can join us. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to have this discussion with you. It struck me that um, you and I are sort of living examples of, of of global citizens, and we try to be great advocates of the idea of looking outward, you know, not inward, as a way to understand our world and and work to make it a safer and smarter and cleaner and more just and a, and a better off place. But it strikes me at the same time that looking at the trends of the past three to five years. Uh, starting even before the onset of the pandemic, it just feels as if globalists are on the defensive, uh, having to work harder to uh, to make our case that uh, this outlook is the best way forward. Now, would you agree that we're on the defensive? And if you agree, what do we do about it? It's a great place to start. Well, first of all, very nice to see you again, Bates, and uh, everything you said about uh, our common ethos. Let me first and foremost say that I would attribute it more to you than to me, and you're a role model in that regard in ways I certainly am not, but aspire to. So, uh, but thank you so much uh, for uh, for this opportunity, and um, I think that is an excellent question. I do believe that there's a pretty significant divergence between what the media would have us believe about this issue, right, globalists on the defensive versus the empirical reality. And I want to stress empirical, because at the end of the day, it is a fact that we live in a world where more people live outside their country of origin than ever before. It is a fact that the countries that are the largest recipients and destinations of voluntary migration, uh, such as Canada, the United States, United Kingdom, Germany, Australia, have more migrants and a higher percentage of foreign-born populations than at any point in recent memory, if not ever. It is a fact that those large countries have changed recent reversals and cynicism and in, in, in their um, uh, immigration policies to actually make it easier to migrate than has been the case in recent years. And that's just migration. It's also a fact that populist governments that trumpet xenophobia, populism, protectionism, nationalism have all failed. And they've failed in such a short amount of time that we can remember their ascent and their demise uh, almost as quickly as those media feedback loops that tell us that they are ascendant. And one last point on all of this is deeper, more philosophical, is this notion of civilizational states that has contributed to that line of thinking, that we live in an age of strongman nationalism, Russia, Turkey, India, China, and that these governments really represent um, a new wave. And we conflate those leaders with the will of their people and the sentiment of their people. Well, we also know that nothing could be further from the truth. We all know that Russia is heavily depopulating as a result of particularly young people seeking to flee. We know that Turkey is not exactly a place where young men stick around to serve their conscription. We know that India is literally the single largest source of emigrants in the entire world with not a second place anywhere in sight. And we know that if the Chinese government were to allow everyone who wanted a passport to have one, that a similar dynamic would unfold. So all of those things point to me in a direction where more people are more global and grateful for those global opportunities than uh, than ever before. And that uh, there are countervailing trends, but I see them as actually being the ones that should be on the defensive, if not for the echo chamber that amplifies them in our kind of Western social media. Well, that's very encouraging. I must say, I, I, I'm glad to hear that response because I've I've been discouraged of late, uh, and and I think it's so good that you can provide us with that empirical background and remind us that indeed it is a, a part of the human condition, isn't it? Uh, to want to move, to want to uh, seek, uh, you know, a better life, and that often requires, uh, more more often than not, uh, might require that one get up uh, and go and find right cross borders. Etc. You know, in your in your most recent book, it's actually mm-hmm. called "Move: The Forces Uprooting Us," and you talk exactly about this phenomenon. I, I love the way the book starts. It, the The question is, um, where are you going to live in 2050? <laughs> and you know, mm-hmm. if I'm lucky enough, I'll be alive then. Um, but you know, I actually asked myself that very question, and I and I realized you are right. I'm not sure. I'm really not sure. Mm-hmm. It could it could be a lot mm-hmm. of different places, and that's just the nature of things. Um, but you, you, you make this great uh, argument about a future going forward of increasing population mobility and that that's going to be brought about both by the sort of positive uh, trends, you know, people seeking better lives, uh, greater opportunity, but also negative. I would call them negative trends, you know, uh, war, uh, climate change, uh, other forces that uh, maybe 
um, require people to seek uh, mobility and movement. But overall, you tell a very positive story, right, about population movements uh, and, and, not, and not a story of nativism or fear. But could you talk a, a little bit more about this? I'd love to hear you know, even more about your thinking on these developments and their implications going forward. Sure. I love the way you set the stage there, because for one thing, when you refer to the nature of things, you know, and you quote this line um, where I say to move is human, right? right. And it is yeah. literally a fundamental anthropological, physiological truth that that to move is human. And that for not only, you know, hundreds of thousands of years or millions of years, but particularly the last 100,000 years since mankind began colonizing the continents, you know, we have been mobile, we have been nomadic. It's a natural occurrence for us to agglomerate into ethnically homogenous tribal units known as states. And this is the fundamental nature of things is certainly not the case in the grand sweep of history. So we need to hold on to that fact that to move is human and that we have the capacity for it. We are increasingly in diluting ourselves ethnically, right? You have more interracial mixed marriage than ever before. If you look at any city with a population of, you know, five to 10 million or more, that's not in China, right? You would have a growing rate of inter-ethnic marriage. Certainly, if you look at Chinese populations around the world, that would conform to the trend, just not Chinese in China, because there's a small presence of non-Chinese people. Uh, so you have, again, all of the most fundamental physiological, ethnographic, anthropological trends pointing towards mobility and towards this um, mongrelization, you know, is one of the terms that I use um, in the book. And uh, so that's one point. The other is what I try to do is to go back historically and look at um, the key drivers of human mobility and whether it is conflict, which is obviously a negative and people flee, but at least those that do and can assimilate and uh, find, you know, new stable uh, locations to call home, they can thrive and prosper. So, you know, uh, fundamentally, the story of survival is both positive and negative, right? It's involuntary, but it can lead to continued flourishing. I look at economics, of course, right? The search for a better life actually is the primary driver, if you will, of most 20th century migration. And that's despite the fact that it was a century of world wars, genocides, expulsions, and so forth. Despite that, bridging uh, labor shortages and demographic imbalances is the primary driver of the of migration waves of the immediate recent period that we're most familiar with. And that brings me to the third point around demographics. We have never lived in a world where the gap between old and young the dependency ratio in our societies and the global gap between young and old, old in the north and young in the south, and particularly in Asia, has been more profound. And if historically that mismatch is rectified through migration, well, then that reason alone will account for a staggering amount of migration in the coming mm -hmm. century. And none of which is to speak to the final two trends. One is technology, of course. So again, both positive and negative. Labor is outsourced factories close, people have to move and search for a better life. So you see the technology feeds into the economics. And the final being, of course, climate change. Now, climate change is an original driver of human migration, the original, and it's back with a vengeance. So, it, and, you know, according to IPCC forecasts and analysis around temperature patterns, for every one degree temperature rise that we have in the world, we can expect one billion people to be displaced from the most propitious latitudes of human habitation that we've known for the last 10,000 years since the retreat of the last ice age. So if you take it all together, right, you tell me what's a more powerful force, today's parochialism in Hungary or the fact that you have climate change, geopolitical conflict, labor imbalances, technological dislocation, and uh, you know economic migration all in hyperdrive. I leave it to you. Fascinating uh, points, and I really appreciate how you, uh, you know, sort of opened up by referring to the fact that, um, you know, in the sweep of history, we've only been doing what we sort of this more sedentary, uh, uh, tribal or state-based organization of society. It's only about what ten thousand, twelve thousand years um, of, of of human existence, so not that long. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and all the while, uh, in spite of those forces, uh, as you so strongly put it, uh, we see the mobility really is, is what, what, what is what makes us human. Mm -hmm. um, so the book's been out, I know you must have been uh, 
uh, going around, uh, talking with lots of people about it, uh, having a chance to get feedback and so on. Tell me, um, has anything happened since the book came out uh, that might make you rethink any of your conclusions, or are you just all the more uh, convinced of them? Well, I'm much more gung ho than ever because evidence is pointing in this direction. Right. And, and you know, bear in mind, I finished the book right before COVID, and then I took the period during COVID to update it. And at the time that I was doing that, you have to imagine how many people, perhaps the whole world, believe that two words would define the mm. present and the future. And those two words are the great lockdown, right? Great lockdown. The notion that all migration was coming to a halt, globalization would reverse. The pandemic was simply the end of, uh, of, of globalism and globalization as we know it. And here we are. And even United Nations data suggests that you know, net international migration patterns continue to expand over the last five years and have uh, surged since COVID. And global trade has held up and you, know, you, can't, get a, you can't get a seat on a plane anymore, right? Everything is sold out. And that's despite inflation even. So I'm blown away by the strength of, again, the mobility thesis and the mobility urge that unites all of us, again, in a fundamental sense, again, in a biological sense. And here's another staggering fact. The number of countries, and this is the ultimate Ripost to the notion of tribalism and nationalism. The number of countries right. that had these nomad visa or golden visa kind of programs in the year 2019, Bates, it was one or two countries. And one of them is called Estonia, a very, very, very small country. Right Today, how many countries have those programs? About 100. Now, somehow, simultaneously, unsynchronized, uncoordinated, right? A hundred countries in the middle of a pandemic when, which was dominated by the two words, great lockdown, somehow a hundred countries decided to do the exact opposite, which is to say, we will beg you, we will pay you, we will bribe you, we will subsidize you, we will offer you permanent residency on arrival. Please come to our country. Please rent our Airbnbs and apartments. Please shop in our malls and eat in our restaurants and use our co-working spaces and be a digital nomad here. Half the world's countries made that decision during the great lockdown. And I need everyone to understand this, <laughs> the notion that, you know, nativism, tribalism, borders define our existence. You know, how, how do you square that? It's wonderful. I mean, it gets us back to that question you raised in the book. Where are you going to live in 2050? Well, now you, have, now you might have 100 choices um, or more. I wanted to get your thoughts uh, on a region uh, that you and I have a fascination over. Uh, Asia. Uh, you've written widely and spoken widely about how this region, Asia, uh, is going to you know be central to the world's future. And of course, you know that's music to the ears of all of us here at Asia Society. You know, um, for almost seventy years, we've been working here, uh, dedicated to trying to understand this critically important part of the world, and try to build bridges you know, between America and Asia. Um, you know, we, we call it navigating our shared future. Um, but you, you've argued uh, that Americans may be focusing too much of their attention uh, on China when they think about Asia uh, and don't see the larger picture of that region. Now, you know, increasingly the challenges that China presents to U.S. interests have clearly compelled a more serious rethink um, that's putting it mildly, uh, about the relationship with China. And that's not true. Uh, that is true of other countries around the world as well. I ask you, do you think that this rethink or this, this or maybe I should put it, uh, the, the argument that you feel Americans are paying too much attention to China and ought to be thinking more broadly, do you think that that has been effectively implemented? Do you think um, there is a, a broader and more serious effort to engage other parts of Asia here in the United States? And and if so, where do you see that happening most effectively? And, and where do we still have a lot of work to do? I think it's a work in progress and it's moving in a positive direction. There's a strong dovetailing of the geopolitical arguments about Asia that I made in the Futurist Asian book, predecessor to this one. And then in MOVE, which is focusing, focusing more on geography, uh, human geography and demographics. 
in the former case, indeed, Asia is, as a geographical fact, much larger than just China, and that it has a rich multi-civilizational and multipolar history. And the large, last 4,000 years of that mostly multi-civilizational and multipolar history is the likely pattern for the future rather than a, a static uh, Chinese you know, unipolar ascendancy, you know, whether in Asia or globally. That's ever more self-evident because of the backlash and you know, challenge uh, to China. Um, and we see that the United States is playing a stronger role through um, military and diplomatic formations, whether it's the Quad or AUKUS or others, and that others are strongly you know, in favor of that. And so the broader thrust is not whether the US or China should dominate Asia. It's that Asia in particular and Eurasia in general shall and must remain multipolar. And that, I think, is something that everyone more or less agrees upon, uh, you know, irrespective of what the perspectives or the current thrusts of Chinese foreign policy may be. So again, I do think that we're moving in the right direction. I think we could have gotten there earlier, but I'm glad that we're moving there now. And I think that it is the equilibrium that we should all seek. Now, demographically, and therefore also to some degree economically, that argument is easier to make than ever because this happens to be the year in which India's population will exceed that of China, you know, numerically. Um, the fastest growing economies in Asia are not China, right? Uh, you see whether it's the Philippines or Vietnam, you know, India to some degree, shifting supply chains, um, you know, away from their excessive concentration in greater China into South and Southeast Asia in particular, through various uh, you know, trade war dynamics and so on, which is really elevating what I call the fourth wave of Asia um, in, into the spotlight. And the fourth wave of Asian growth is the term and the category that I defined in the, in the Asia book, where I looked at South and Southeast Asia, following the first wave of Japan, the second wave of the tiger economies, the third wave of China, and now the fourth wave. And if you take the combined demographic size of the fourth wave economies from Pakistan, India, through Bangladesh, through ASEAN, that's 2.5 billion people. And every one of those countries has a younger median age than China, save for uh, Thailand, which is roughly similar. And you have obviously, again, strong growth rates, increasingly more open economies, countries joining various trade agreements, uh, pursuing industrial policies, trying very hard to modernize, attract investment, raise productivity, connect to global supply chains, and so forth. So really doing all the right things, you might say. Um, so I think that too really diversifies the, the picture of what is Asia and what do we think of and who do we think of when we speak of Asia. So again, that broader diffusion towards embracing the richness, the rich tapestry, again, geographically, culturally, economically, and geopolitically of Asia, is the central message that I've been, you know, promoting for uh, quite a few years now, and you have as well. Let's drill down a little bit more on China here. You know, one of the one of the projects that we're going to be undertaking here in the new Center for China Analysis is to ask the question: Is uh, you know, have we seen peak China, and and how will we know if we do? And I think you're 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 suggesting some things in, in this notion about the fourth wave. I think is uh, you know, intertwined with that. With that question, and in my read of recent developments coming out of China over the past several years, I see a, a worrisome tendency that's gaining momentum, and that is a decided shift in the thinking of Chinese leadership away from uh, connectivity, away from globalized or a globalizing paradigm and toward a greater focus on China's internal market and indigenous innovation, relying more on themselves than on uh, the outside world. And you know, coming from a country that has been so central to a globalizing Asia, well, first of all, do you see this shift or is it, is it just something I'm, I'm reading too much into it? But if there is this shift ongoing, how is that going to affect Asia's future and the future developments in the world more broadly. Mm -hmm. Well, you're pointing to very salient facts, for sure, in terms of what we are observing in China and how many people are analyzing China's intentions around self-reliance and so forth. But to step back for a moment, it isn't new for rising powers to use import substitution practices, right, to build their industrial base. 
um, and to rise into the pantheon of great powers in the first place. That's how Britain became Britain. It's called mercantilism. It's how America became America, Hamiltonian import substitution and economic nationalism. So China is not deviating from the playbook of Europe's historical great powers in their mercantilism, nor the import substitution industrial policy of the United States. In fact, it's copying precisely those things that it's learned from history. And so we shouldn't fault China in, in the same way that we would not fault any rising power from seeking to endogenize uh, foreign technologies and modernization, right? In, in Not in modernization theory in the political science sense, but in just economic modernization and the, and the foundations of it. So that, that's, that's one thing. The second is, I think some nuance is needed around whether China's turning inward is an either or rather than a both and phenomenon. Because, you know, analysts of the Chinese economy say, well, they really need to rebalance and there needs to be more consumption and they have to really open up the services economy further and transfer wealth from the government to households and all of these kind of, you know, all of these sorts of things. Well, if you want to do that, obviously, that requires something of a turn inwards, among other reforms that China is not necessarily undertaking, but those are among them. So we have to point out that you can't just have it both ways in terms of uh, the, the political and to some degree, the uh, economic policy turn. The second, though, and I think more importantly, in terms of how China relates to Asia and the world, is that I think the Chinese themselves would dispute that. Because if you look at the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, the Belt and Road Initiative, Dual Circulation, and their Global Security Initiative, that one last one is obviously quite vague. But from China's standpoint, they remain quite globally connected. Thank you very much, right? They're still the largest trading partner of 125 countries in the world, more than any other. Of course, Belt and Road has focused away from some of the markets where there's political hesitancy and even backlash. But that doesn't mean that it's not reaching out its tentacles, you know, uh, to very important geographies, because you can clearly see a shift in investment, not a retreat investment. Well, there's some retreat investment, but the shift favors West Asia, Southeast Asia, Central Asia. Those are not insignificant regions. Just because there's less FDI going into the United States, less FDI going into Europe, it doesn't mean that China is not seeking to build international partnerships, right? And RCEP, uh, to speak just of that, Yes, it's a regional agreement, but it's the largest region in the world. And it's uh, right. It's also the largest free trade agreement by volume and demographics in, in world history. And we in the economic literature tend to discount the you know, net aggregate impact in terms of GDP gains of these trade agreements. And China is obviously central to that agreement. So again, there are many reasons why one would dispute the notion that China is you know, literally turning inward. U.S.-China trade in the year 2022 will have been 10% larger than 2021, just to bear in mind. So we don't really see decoupling yet. You know, I'm being charitable in that. Now, how does all this relate to Chinese power? I mean, I think when I started speaking about peak China about maybe five, five years ago, and it's a theme in the Asia book, I think uh, people found that really premature. But the reason I was making the argument is not because China's economy is stopping, is not growing, because of course it is, we will continue to trudge along. And I didn't say it because of Chinese demographics, because even though in that sense we are nearing peak China, I actually point out to China's massive investments in industrial robotics and automation, which has actually maintained or allowed it to maintain a very significant uh, industrial output and to remain the export powerhouse of the world. So I don't think that's even demographically dependent. I made the argument on the geopolitical grounds that it's not just China that's awakening, it's also everyone else that's awakening. And that the pushback against China's policies, practices, and you know overreach would engender this awakening and stoke it and lead to countries standing up and saying, hey, you know, we are great too. We have a rich history too. You know, we have sovereignty too. We have interests also. And you're hearing that from uh, from India. You're hearing that uh, really all across uh, Asia, even as far as Africa. And that's the reason why I made the peak China argument, not because of necessarily endogenous characteristics of China, because I actually have a lot of faith that Chinese policymakers, um, you know, are able to navigate the unprecedented demographic and other challenges that face them, given their resources and ability to allocate uh, resources to 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 tackle challenges, but they don't control the international environment, right? They attempt to shape the international environment, but the international environment can also shape them. 
And I think very often when we speak about China, we just look at China's actions and we don't look at the reactions to China's actions. And my work has been focused on the reactions to China's actions. Just as you know, Bates, we could rattle off 25 acronyms uh, like the Build Back Better World, the Resilient Supply Chain Initiative, the CHIPS Act. I mean, not one of these acronyms emerging from Western capitals existed five years ago, right? They're a response to what China has been doing. And we tend to not factor in the response. And I'm giving us a lot of credit in that response. Do you think it matters uh, that you know China does have? Uh, I mean, it's it's not a, a net immigration plus country. In other words, you know, it's, it's not widely open to immigrants. It's not as seen by immigrants as a particularly attractive place necessarily to go, even if it were. Um, do you think that matters? I mean, as, as in thinking about China and your book Move, you, you you suggest that through technology and good policy, China can deal with some of its demographic challenges. But what about the fact that it's likely to remain an ethnically homogenous place for for a long, long time to come. Mm -hmm. There's only about 10 countries in the world that meet that literal academic def definition of being a nation state, right? Being, you know, having 90% or whatever of their population be of the same ethnic uh, group. And China is one of them. Japan is also one of them. Bangladesh is another. And those three are the largest by far that meet that definition. You could say that it's a special case, right? Certainly a special case. And those three large countries will probably in perpetuity, at least in the meaningful future, be, you know, fit that definition. I once wrote a cheeky article titled, Can China Be a Melting Pot? And uh, and uh, obviously, I meant it sort of tongue in cheek. But what I was just pointing to was uh, what feels like a bygone era that you're also referring to maybe, you know, uh, eight, 10 years ago, when China was opening up and had launched 1000 talents programs and was seeking to recruit foreign scientists and issue, you know, equivalents of green cards and all of these kinds of things. And of course, there was also lots of what they would call Belt and Road students, right? So even if the number of American or European students has begun to decline in the last few years prior to COVID, foreign student numbers, non-Western, were actually still rising. So you could have made the case that, you know, the absolute number of foreigners who might see China as a home for academic or business or other vocational reasons, you know, could trundle along, right? It would again, always be nothing more than a drop in the bucket. Now we obviously see a reversal in that. Again, it's going to revert to what you're describing as the mean, right? Which is basically China being, you know, mostly almost entirely homogenous, both not just in terms of stock and flow of populations, but also obviously, um, you know, sort of in its cultural orientation. And that's uh, a function of a whole lot of realities that, that you and I've been discussing. However, when you talk about China as being in demographic decline, the special case of its population size has to be taken into account. And it almost never is in conversations like that. We forget that even though China is aging, given higher life expectancy in the one-child policy, you know, statistically it's aging. But a country that large still has, you know, 50% of its population below the median age, and that happens to be 700 million people. So you have 700 million people in China who are millennials or Gen Z or Gen Alpha. So to put it in perspective, China has more young people than all of Europe has people. And we tend to forget that when we just refer to China as an aging country, as if it's Japan. Well, Japan doesn't have as many young people as China has. It doesn't even have a fraction. We have to, you know, look at Chinese demographics holistically and how China allocates those 700 million young people uh, in the domestic services economy to be the caregivers for the elderly and all of these other things is going to shape its economic evolution uh, and its societal kind of characteristics in, in the future. Does it still need to import a fair number of certainly caregivers and certain other sectors? Yes. In fact, I think the chapter I have on China in this book begins with the sentence, the world's largest country needs more people right now. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, will, will you know, China continue to selectively import foreign workers? Yes. Um, but, you know, speaking of young people, I, I, I wanted to just raise one last question with you and, and get your thoughts. Um, you know, what advice would you offer then to young people today? People who are, you know, just maybe just finishing university or are at that age of leaving home and they want a global career. How should they be interpreting what I see as some dist disturbing trends out there in the, in the world of division and rivalry? How, how do they avoid some of the pitfalls that have been thrown their way by the pandemic and, and other forces? And, and what are the skill sets that you think they're going to need to thrive 
and succeed in the world between now and, and 2050? It's a great question. I mean, the answer I give in the book is two words, which is be mobile. Uh, and that is the highest virtue that a young person can have. Never have there been more countries, you know, that are willing and want to accept, you know, young talent because they so desperately need it demographically and economically. And for Asians, a preponderant share of the world's young population, it's actually a golden age because Asians, you know, who are increasingly educated, um, have studied technical fields, are in high demand everywhere. If you look at the university curricula and the language of instruction across Europe, many have switched from national languages to English. So being an English speaking young Asian with some education, you know, there's never been a better time. But it's not a surprise at all, those fundamental drivers of migration, right? Again, supply and demand, the demographic imbalances and so forth. So I urge young people to be optimistic and opportunistic.